Hi, Tech. How's it going, Desiree? So happy to be here. I'm so glad that you invited me on. It is a tremendous honor to talk to you. So I do appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad that you agreed to do this because I know it's not your normal your normal thing, but I think it's going to be fun. And I think it's going to be surprising because a lot of people are going to find out some interesting things today. We will see. Yeah. All right. So um, why don't we start off with you telling us who you are, what you do, because even though I know, I know a lot of people listening, this is going to be the first time they meet you. All right. Well, I am from Sunny state of Florida, South Florida. I have been selling on eBay for probably 16 years now. I always say 15 years, but eventually 15 turns to 16. So I would say 16 years now since around 2008 and started just like everybody else. One item, pile in the corner inventory system. Um, several years later, all the way up to 53,000 items. I had five people on staff. We would make live 250 items every single day and sell 250 items every single day and eventually became number one in all of the pre-owned men's clothing categories. I also have a brick and mortar store that deals with vintage clothing. Um, we do wholesale, a little bit of whatnot. So all in all, um, I think that I took the pre-owned men's clothing just about as far as one could take it. And... That's pretty much my story as far as reselling goes. I really enjoy to do it. I enjoy finding something that has been discarded or thrown away or not cared for and making money magically pop out of thin air. That's my favorite thing in the world to do. And when we go to the thrift store and these things, you know, have been donated and we can see the value because we have taken the time to seek the knowledge. And we know that this particular item can sell for X price and the thrift store is selling it for lower. There's no greater thing in the world for me. And I really, really enjoy doing that and have done so every single day for the last 15, 16 years of my life. Wow, that's impressive. So um, I guess before we get into all of my questions, we should probably answer the obvious question. And that is why is the number one men's clothing reseller on a jewelry podcast. How should we explain that? I'm not really sure. I know that <laughs> in the group, we do have a jewelry call. It's fantastic jewelry call. And for a couple of weeks, I hosted the jewelry call. Mm -hmm. I am by no means, any way, shape or form, a jewelry expert or a jewelry seller. But I do know a couple of the calls that I hosted was um, Bohemian Jewelry, Czech Jewelry. And um, we did Intaglios and Cameos. And I did learn a lot through those calls. And when I am at the flea market, I would be lying if I didn't peruse the jewelry cases, looking for some cameos or intaglios or seeing if there's some Niger brothers in there. But I am by no means a jewelry professional. It's just I put a little bit of time in, learned a little bit of stuff. Um, but I am a sucker for filigree. So if I see some in there, I'm going to take another take a closer look, but I am by no means a jewelry seller. I do listen to all the jewelry calls. I think that they are fantastic. I think what I like most about jewelry is that a lot of it is very nuanced. There's not a lot of brands. Um, there's a lot that's open for interpretation, but that interpretation is going to rely on how much you know, how much you've educated yourself. Because you can grab an item and in your interpretation, it could be worth a bajillion dollars. But like, unless the, the market and your education backs that up, it's obviously not worth a bajillion dollars. So I think that all of your keywords, um, all the nuance, I think in the jewelry category is never ending. Like, I don't know if you can ever know everything about the jewelry category, especially with all the new trends coming out, what's popular, what's not popular just the history of jewelry, like there's so much involved in it. And I think that that portion of jewelry, I do find very interesting. Yeah. So I think when we all were, um, we all were really surprised when you decided to, <laughs> to lead the jewelry calls because, you know, I mean, 
you're like the clothing guy. And so for you to kind of really jump into the, the jewelry call, I have to tell you, a lot of us were shocked. <laughs> well, someone's got to do it. We were kind of in a space where we needed someone to um, bridge the gap for a couple of weeks. And I didn't want to leave you guys hanging. So I gave it my best shot. And I think whenever you give somebody your best shot and your best effort, I think that everyone around is going to respect that. So I, I think all of you guys knew that I gave it my best shot, best effort. Might have not been perfect. But I think that there was some nuggets that could be extracted from those discussions. So I think at the end of the day, that's really all anybody can ask from us is to give our best shot, our best effort. And for those jewelry calls, I absolutely did. Yeah, I was very impressed. And I think that's going to lead me into my um, my first question, really. And because um, I know jewelry was a brand new category for you. So let's talk about how you approached learning a brand new category. All right. So I got lucky because we had already decided and pre-planned what the call was going to be. So I didn't have to dive headfirst into jewelry. And I think even if that was the case, I think it's probably best to segment and then learn little pieces of it the same way, I guess, how somebody would learn clothing. If you had to learn all clothing, that is a very daunting task. But if you can segment it and kind of learn different things um, in a smaller portion, it's probably much easier to retain the information. So I did get lucky in the first call, it was suggested to do Bohemian jewelry. And then from there, um, I believe I went on to YouTube and checked out a couple good videos. Um, one that I can remember was by Vintage Variety. And we're talking like a year ago. So I watched this video by Vintage Variety a year ago, and she went over kind of all the, the beginner terms um, what to look for, what are the, I guess, aspects when it does come to identifying something as Czech jewelry or Bohemian jewelry. Um, and then after that, I went to Wikipedia. And everything that I don't understand on Wikipedia or from the YouTube video, I would write it down, or in this case, in the year 2024, I would type it. I would type it, and then I would go to Google, and then I would Google what that was. So even on the video or on, on Wikipedia, they brought up um, rondelles, which I didn't know what that was. The only Rondell I know is Rondell White, who was the center fielder for the World Series champion, 1997 Florida Marlins. That's the only Rondell I know. See, and but, I don't even know that Rondell. Right. That's the only Rondell that I know. But we were talking about rondos for jewelry, so I needed to know what that was. So I went to Google. I typed in, what is a jewelry Rondell? And that told me what it was. What was satin glass that told me what it was? What was e Egyptian revival that told me what it was? What was Art Deco? I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with Art Deco because South Beach in Miami is very Art Deco. But when it comes to jewelry, that's totally different. So I, I needed to know what these words were in order to win at the game. So like, I'm a big believer if you want to win the game, you have to know all the rules. So every single time I don't know what something is, I Google it. So that way I can at least know what it is, because how can we list an item if we don't understand the keywords or the concepts in what we're dealing with? So like now that I figured out what rondelles was, what satin glass, what art deco, filigree, um, once I figured out, you know, sometimes it will be marked, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it will say Czech, Czechoslovakia, sometimes it will be misspelled. All of these things are like rules to Bohemian and and check jewelry which i had to have a fundamental understanding if i wanted to be able to do this successfully it's same like clothing when we when ebay introduced item specifics and they have the drop down box i went through every single item specific that i did not know and i put it into google and i put it into google image to get a visual and a definition and i did that for every single item specific and if you really want to go down a rabbit hole, list a woman's hat and then put item specific styles. eBay has some ridiculous item specifics in there for styles. Like they have one for like cone head hats. Like that's an item specific. But unless you look at the definition, you just live life blinded and just, I don't know what this is and, and just disregard it. So for, for jewelry, when I was listening to the videos, when I was going through with the Wikipedia and going through some online resources. Every single time I didn't know what something was, I had another tab open and I would look at the definition and another tab open where I would look at a photograph. 
And that there taught me um, the item specifics, which I can then take out and do something actionable and go out into the field and say, that's satin glass, that's Egyptian revival, that's this, rather than just saying Egyptian revival, what does that mean? What does that mean? Like pyramids walk like an Egyptian? I don't know. What does that mean? But Egyptian revival, since I looked at the definition and I looked at examples, now I know that's actionable. So basically then you were learning all the different, not just details, but also the specifics of certain pieces or certain styles or certain characteristics, characteristics or design or yes. motifs. Yes. Is that what you're saying? That's how you basically filtered everything down to learn a specific type or a specific brand or a specific style? Yes. And I think that that's pretty much how I live my entire life. If I don't know what something is, I'll stop my car and go on Google and type in like, what is this? How does this work? Always. I've done that forever. And when I was really little, I used to ask my mom a bunch of questions that she didn't know the answers to, just like every little kid does. I would ask my mom, what are clouds? What are clouds made of? How are clouds formed? And she didn't know. She didn't know these answers. And we're talking in, in the early 80s, like there wasn't no internet. And I think that the best thing my mom ever did was she bought some encyclopedias from a door-to-door -door salesman, and she had me carry around those encyclopedias everywhere that we went, even before I can read. So like, I think that that thirst for acquiring knowledge goes all the way back from when I was a little kid and I can still see the encyclopedia. I can still see the pages now clear and vividly in my head of being in the backseat of an old beat up car and scrolling through this encyclopedia, figuring out stuff that I didn't know what it was. Every single time I had a question, my mom told me, go look in the encyclopedia and I would have to go over there and I would have to figure it out. And I think a lot of that helps me and is beneficial to this day where if i don't know how something works i don't know what something is we have the marvelous invention of the google machine and it will literally tell you and once you understand stuff every single time you learn something new it opens up an entirely new world and for jewelry i didn't know any of this but i learned a couple things i learned some new stuff and now i have an entire new world inside of this segment of jewelry but the alternative is disregard not knowing and just continue on with your day. And that doesn't sound as exciting to me. So you weren't intimidated then by by jewelry. You were just even more curious. Yeah, absolutely not. I I I love new things and I love new facts. And you've known me for a long time. All of my calls, I speak factually. If I'm going to speculate, I will I will clear it and say this is speculation. I love facts and I love new things. And that's why I enjoy so much Desiree's News of the Week on the YouTube call because you come factual, you come with, with, with resources, citations, links. That's why that's my favorite part because I know this is not nonsense. This is new to me and I can take something from here and like I said, open up a portion of an entirely new world. So like you'll come. Every single week, you'll have three or four links, something new. Even if it has nothing to do with me, you were talking about um, getting monetized on TikTok. I may never be monetized on TikTok, but at least I have somewhat of an understanding based on what you brought where I at least know how that works. I at least know it's a possibility. And if I want to, I can pursue it further by acquiring more knowledge, acquiring more answers. And every single week, news of the week. That's my favorite thing because there's nothing more in the world that I like more than facts and just having new doors open to explore. That's so weird that you say that because I'm the exact same way. That's why I made a career <laughs> out yeah. of finding out information, sharing information. And then, you know, it's always something different, right? So I know yes. a, a little about a lot. I think that's that's the phrase, but I'm the same way. Like, I can spend hours and hours and hours just researching anything, right. anything that I want to know. Yeah. And I don't get bored. It's not a chore. No. And um, it's like the more I, I learn, the more I want, I want to know. So, so I totally understand that. So for you, though, I struggle with anything that's fantasy, with anything that's not real. Like my wife will be watching some shows 
I clock out immediately when I go, that's not real. That will never happen. Like the scene <laughs> where they're running through a million different obstacles and doing, I'm like, fake, I'm out. I can't do it. But if it's factual, I got no problem with it. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like I can watch documentaries all day long, yeah. but I, I can't tell you the last time I, I went to like a movie. I don't know can't the do latest it. Disney film or the latest yeah. Marvel. Like I'm not into that, yeah. but I will watch documentaries. Same. Any day, every day. Same. Okay, uh, let's see. You've answered a lot of my questions already. Well, maybe not. Okay, so this is a good one. Um, do you think jewelry resellers have the same potential to make as much as you did with clothing? So I think take me out of the equation because I had, I'm very fortunate. So I think let, let's just, can you make a living selling jewelry? Absolutely. Can you sell millions of dollars? Absolutely. But millions of dollars is the anomaly. So I, I like to look at median also and not average. So like exclude the top 10%, exclude the bottom 10%. Can we hit this scatter plot on, an, on a more than average than not basis? Absolutely, I think so. But again, jewelry poses so many challenges um, just due to the nuance and due to the lack of no brand name. And I think that eBay is very, very structured on brand because if you list a vintage Harley Davidson shirt, people are searching for that. eBay knows how to find it. If you list a vintage 1986 motorcycle rally shirt, unbranded, that's a hard item for eBay to find. That's a hard item for a customer to type in the search bar. I'm looking for a vintage 1986 motorcycle rally shirt from South Carolina. No customer in the history of eBay has ever typed that string of characters. So because there is that nuance that neglects the brand, I think that is one of the biggest challenges for jewelry sellers. However, the market cap is there to allow for a bunch of people to find the success that they're looking for. And there's not just one way to sell jewelry. You, you can sell jewelry for scrap. You can sell in lots. You can sell fine jewelry. You can sell costume jewelry. They have this kind of jewelry, this kind of jewelry, this kind. They have a bunch of different kinds of jewelry that you can go and you can study, learn, be proficient at. And even some people have taken it a step further and they've decided that they're going to deal with one particular kind of jewelry. And then they've kind of figured out how to acquire that kind of jewelry and become a specialist based on that. Now, some of those people that do that, they have the fallback of, of having a brand name associated with it. Where some items like an earring or maybe a necklace, when it comes to custom jewelry, maybe you don't have that brand to fall back on. And without that brand, it requires keywords and nuance where you really, really, really have to get to know the customer and become an expert inside of the niche. It, it, the, if the question is, can you casually sell jewelry and, and, and be successful? I think no. I think no. I think it's very competitive. I think there's a lot of people that know what they're doing. And I think that if you're casual, you're not going to know the customer, you're not going to know the nuance, and you're not going to learn the keywords. Yeah, I agree. And I think, too, a lot of people, um, they always add jewelry on. Well, I shouldn't say all, but from what I've learned and from what I've seen, people like to add jewelry on as a secondary category just for, you know, because it's small. A lot of people yeah. don't have a lot of space. Yeah. And so people dive in, but then they don't realize that it's a lot of work. <laughs> there's a lot that you need. Um, there's a lot that you need to learn. I mean, it's not just the jewelry. It's also about, like you said, the keywords and styling the pieces and, and learning about the materials and all these things. And um, I think that's where a lot of people trip up and a lot of people get scared. So take me through this. For my understanding, and I guess there's two, 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 two ways to do it. One is to buy lots. One is mm -hmm. to go around to antique malls, flea markets, thrift store, and just buy one at a time. Mm -hmm. But from my experience, those are kind of the, the two ways that people do it. So take me through like buying a lot. So you would have to sort, 
figure out what's worthwhile, figure out what's not worthwhile. You're talking about after I already bought it? Yeah, yeah. You, you already bought, you bought the vase. Mm -hmm. you, you bring it home. What's the next step for a jewelry seller? Well, I mean, if, well, if we're talking about jewelry jars, because remember, that's a whole different thing. Okay. Jewelry jars are very different than a box lot. Box lot is very different from a mystery lot. All right, break <laughs> right? them all down for me. All right, we right? got the vase. What's the difference between a vase, a box lot? And of course, a mystery lot, I got that. Vase and box lot, what's the difference? Okay, so we've got, well, they're called jewelry jars or jewelry bags, and they're basically random jewelry thrown in a bag, and they're, you can find them usually at the thrift store. Yes. Goodwill, Savers. Yes. And you can kind of get a look at what's in there. So I really don't buy jewelry jars anymore. I may buy them just for content on social media, but I don't buy them with the intent of selling them. And that's only if they're really, really cheap. Okay. So that's that. Okay. Now, if I buy a, a box lot of something, I know what's in it and I know what I'm getting. I don't do the mystery boxes anymore. Sure. <laughs> I did many years ago, but now I don't. Um, so I a buy box a box lot of vintage is Everything jewelry. is laid out already and you can kind of assess it? For the most part, yeah. Okay. Yeah, especially if I'm doing an online auction or, or an in-person auction, they'll have okay. everything laid out. Okay. So... A vase is kind of in the middle of a mystery box and a box lot. You can kind of see half. Not even. I would say a jewelry jar sometimes uh, could even be like a craft lot where it's just a bunch of stuff thrown in there that's broken. <laughs> so do you guys feel that the vases at Goodwill have been heavily, heavily called through and cherry picked? Oh, absolutely. In my opinion, but every now and again, you'll see someone opening one on YouTube yeah. And they find something amazing, but it'll, yeah. it'll probably just be that one thing. Hmm. All right. So that's a complexity. The sourcing portion is a complexity. So yes. it, it's either in a lot or you're really spending a lot of time putting boots on the ground, really going to antique malls, jewelry, you know, festivals or, or get togethers, gatherings, flea markets, maybe the garage sale. And if you're the latter of one at a time, you really have to know your stuff then, right? Oh, yeah. 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 You know, and even now, I don't really source at at Goodwill or, you know, Savers or anything like that. I mean, I'll go in there and look, but I don't go in there with the intention of buying the quantity I need for the day, for the week, for the month or whatever. So, I mean, you really have to get strategic, not only with your sourcing. And that was one of my questions that we'll probably get to eventually, but... Um, it's not only it's it's not only finding the stuff, but then being able to find the quantity of stuff. Sure. And then it's being being able to find it on a consistent basis. Right. And exactly that that's kind of like the ending point that I was hoping we would get to because that's outside looking in. That's that's what I see as far as jewelry sourcing going. So when you do go to some sort of jewelry show, and you've talked about doing this before. The people who set up our jewelry shows are obviously passionate. They obviously have some sort of understanding of what they have. How do you win at that sourcing when you are sourcing from someone that is passionate and kind of has a pretty good idea? You, are you talking about buying? buying yeah. stuff? How do you buy at a jewelry show where someone is equally, if not as more passionate than you are about their own jewelry that they're selling? I don't. I don't see where there would be much arbitrage in that. Well, that's where this is. I was just talking about this with my friend, Jen, and this is how we do it. You basically have to have a budget set up of whatever it is, thousand, two thousand, five hundred dollars, whatever. And you're ready to buy when you find it. And then okay. when you find it, you buy it and you hope that that's enough <laughs> to last you for a month, three months. In some people, they buy enough for a year, depending if someone's buying out an entire estate sale or someone's entire jewelry collection. So it's basically, that's how I have found that you can win at this is you're ready to buy when, because they're not going to, you're not going to find jewelry, sh you know, just showing up all, every week. Sure. Yeah. And so when you see it, you have to have the money to say, okay, I'll buy all 1000 pieces or I'll buy all 5000 pieces or whatever it is. And sure. then you budget those pieces out <laughs> and hope that you can list five a day, 10 a day, 20 a day, whatever, whatever you do. 
So that's the way that I have found that works because you're not going to, even if you went to 10 thrift stores in a day, you're probably not going to find enough pieces to even list every day for a week. I know in my district, I can probably count the jewelry jars that I've seen on one or two hands. And I don't recall seeing any jewelry that was able to source. But in my district, I've also never seen a video game either. So a lot of that stuff here gets called out and sent to probably online. So I, if, if you were a jewelry seller here, I don't know if thrifting is an option. Um, you would have to go to the flea market or garage sales here. Yeah. And then that also, it kind of leads me to the next thing where you really have to build relationships yes. because I really just connected with this um, estate sale company here. And she's like, oh, we always have jewelry. So I may start buying stuff from her. I mean, but she doesn't yeah. get it every, you know, every week. She, she may not get it for months. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and that's just one complexity of jewelry, you know, after you get it, after you process it, um, you know, maybe repairs are needed. You got to wash it sometimes, maybe, um, especially if you get it in a lot, there, there might be a couple things you have to do for prep in order to get it to list. And then after that, photos, you know, those can be a nightmare unless you're really set up to do them. Um, and then after that, you have to know the keywords and the customers and every single nuance. If, if you want to stand a chance of that thing selling, if you want to stand a chance of that thing selling for the best price possible. So I think with all of those things combined, like the complexity of acquiring the product, um, photos are not the easiest. And then the complexities of listing. I think that to be a casual seller, I think it's probably very hard. I think you have to be all in, very passionate about it in order to truly find success. And success is subjective. I I'm talking full-time income comfortable rather than well, less than full-time income struggling a little more. Yeah. And that's where, where you really have to kind of get dialed in on your target buyer as well. Yeah. Because I mean, yeah, I could probably make a full-time living just selling random like jewelry pieces that are unmarked and unbranded, but that's, I mean, I'm not going to get there at like, you know, $5 a piece, $10 a piece, even $20 a piece. So it really kind of depends on who you're targeting. And then you have to just find out what they want. I mean, it's just like any other category. Yeah. yeah. But and the thing with jewelry is like people are very, very picky. Sure. And um, there's, there's not a, a consistent supply of it as it relates to the vintage stuff. And that's usually what people are looking for. People love the antique jewelry. People love the vintage jewelry. And then there's also different levels to this game, which I'm still learning, sure. where there's people who only deal with um, pieces that are thousands of dollars, tens right. of thousands of dollars, right. you know. And uh, you have to kind of be in those circles, which I'm not, at least not yet. And um, so, you know, there's there's a whole nother level to, to being able to access jewelry. But for the, the average seller, um, sure. they're not going to, they're not going to. I, I think the, the two people that I can recall at my flea market that dealt in jewelry. And I, I was going every single weekend, three times a week for well over a decade. There was a lady out there who would be all over the, the jewelry tables. And I think she was looking for people that didn't know it was um, gold or silver. And she was buying that. So she had that expertise. And then there was a guy out there who was there really early. And everyone knows this guy. And he would go around, ask everyone if they had gold. And he would buy the gold. So he would take the necklaces. He would take the rings. He would take all of that. And he must have went and he must have melted it down and sold it for scrap. So like those are two more additional business models. However, those ones, I guess the, the lady that was looking for, you know, the, the materials that were mixed in with the, the fashion jewelry. I mean, that, that, that probably takes a real expertise and that's probably, you know, throwing a lot of stuff at the wall and maybe grabbing a couple pieces. Um, but the other guy who bought the gold and bought the silver, 
that guy made a fortune. That guy always had a brand new expensive truck every single year. Um, but also he would pull out a stack of money that was this big every single day. And he had very small margins because people aren't fools either. So like if, if they knew what scrap was, you have to come very close to that. Maybe he was paying 90, 95% of scrap, but he was always out there and it looked like he was doing very well. And like you said, he made those connections and, and he built those relationships, especially with the storage unit guys, because they would always come with some kind of jewelry. And rather than trying to sell it because they had no idea what it was, they would call him as soon as they got to the flea market and he would come over and you would see him looking through it, doing his calculations, weighing it, and then he would pay them. So um, those are kind of two of the models that I've seen like people do long term. There's a lot of people that go out there for a little while and then don't come back. But for those people, they were out there as long as I was. So they must have been finding some sort of success. But I know that's a that's a different business model than most people who deal in jewelry, especially on eBay. Yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, it's it's not easy. I mean, but then again, I don't know any category that's really, quote, easy. Um, you know, there's yeah. always a lot to learn and there's always more to learn. And then always. there's always more to learn. <laughs> always. If this was easy, like imagine how incredible this world would be if you could just throw stuff on eBay and just have your bank account fill up with money. But unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way. All right. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's been working. It's been working for me, kind of, sort of, you know, it kind of goes in waves. Yeah. So um, that's why I need to I need to stay on top of my game as well. Absolutely. Always. Because there, there's new trends and new things to learn. So um, every single what every month, there's a new core, Barbie core, cottage core, all of that stuff has accessories that correspond with it. So you have to be up on those trends where you're on the new core. And Barbie core is out. So if you're out here still sourcing Barbie core stuff, that stuff may potentially sit. So, you know, all of those fashion trends that do come do have corresponding accessories and jewelry that, you know, probably jewelry sellers can ride that wave, like you said, and keep an eye out for it. As long as you can process it quickly and you could, you know, read the trends. Some of them last longer than others. But um, yeah, like you said, it is it is all about riding the wave. And I think it's like that for for all of the niches, because even though clothing is kind of stable, um, the inventory kind of comes and goes. So you have to get it while it's good. And hopefully you have enough to kind of get you through those times where, you know, maybe people aren't donating as much. And I see it every single year, like in in the summertime for us, there's a lot of stuff because people have processed that spring cleaning. But then like towards the after the summertime, it kind of gets really slow. Um, and then after Christmas, it gets good again. So even for, for us, it kind of goes like this. And you got to be able to maintain it and ride that wave in terms of sourcing. Yeah. You know, I think and the thing is, is it will change too. like, yeah. you know, nothing really lasts forever. I mean, there was a time when you could go to Goodwill and <laughs> buy some great stuff. But I mean, it's yeah. not like that anymore. Not even nope. close. Not even close. And I think it's going to get more difficult, more more challenging um, to rely on chains like Goodwill, ones that do have the option and are building out the infrastructure to get more of all the money for this stuff by either sending it online or building their own marketplaces. Because in my district, my district is kind of the pioneer for a lot of the things that end up going nationwide. Um, they were the pioneer of the blue box. They were the pioneer of um, setting up their own online auction sites for those particular stores. And every single time that happens, more and more of the stuff gets sifted out and sent over there because they're a business too. Like they have to maximize profits. They have to drive revenue. They have overhead. They have infrastructure. So I get it. Like they need, when they do get good stuff, they need to get closer to all of the money because how high has their rent gone up since the shutdown? How high has their labor gone up, even though it is subsidized some of it, like they have a bunch of costs, a bunch of infrastructure, property taxes are through the roof, like they have to pay that stuff for for the buildings that they own. So and, you know, it, it's not 2005 anymore. We In 2005, we didn't have iPhones like th this is a new generation, a, a new reality and online selling. It's easy to sell online, but selling online is not easy. 
So like for them, it's easy to sell online. They, they throw a bunch of stuff on the ground. They take one picture. They send it out to a nationwide audience. And if there's a couple experts in there, all they need is two. They'll bid it up. And that's fine because that's more money than they would have got by putting it on the, on the rack. That works great for them. Now, we can't do the same thing. So for them, it's beneficial to sift everything that has any sort of value, take one photo and let, let the people decide what it's worth rather than marking it at $399, $699 and putting it on the rack and letting go of a $40, $50, $60 item just because. They, they, don't, they don't have to do that anymore. So like that, that challenge, I think, hits especially hard jewelry sellers because that's one of the, from, from a goodwill perspective, that's one of the lowest hanging fruits where any jewelry, throw it in a medium flat rate, take a picture and mail it out. You, you could fit hundreds of pieces in there. Whereas maybe clothing has different sort of nuances where you can't just say any piece of clothing, we're going to go over here and we're going to get all the money or close to all the money because it takes up a lot more space, requires a lot more training. Different brands mean different things. Like you can have a shirt with a bear on it. And if it's no brand, it's worth $2. If it's polo, it could be worth 2000 There's a lot of different nuances. So it's much harder to train rather than any piece of jewelry stick it in this bag and then we're going to auction the bag. So I think that jewelry, I, I think jewelry sellers got hit particularly hard um, with reselling becoming, you know, much more accessible, especially for the people that we source from. Yeah. And that's another thing that draws people to the jewelry category is like, it's an easy item to sell in the sense that you don't have to lift heavy boxes. You don't have to do a lot of handling. You know what I mean? Because I know a lot of people who are disabled who are yeah, online sure. jewelry sellers because that's what they are physically able to do because they can't yeah. move boxes. They can't, you know, do all that kind of stuff. Right. So um, I think there's a lot that attracts people to the jewelry category. And there's people like me who just think it's it's pretty and fun and and, you know, something that I enjoy, but there's some people who really appreciate um, the history and the stories behind the pieces. And so um, I think that's a lot of what's missing too when people source from Goodwill, because I've been told many times that people like to buy from someone else who is passionate about jewelry instead of someone who's just trying to make the most money, you know, because people really are fans of a particular style or type of jewelry. So I think there there will be a little bit more of a personal investment as it relates to, yeah. to selling jewelry because I have private clients now that I, I source for and I know what they like and they buy from me. And um, I think that's really gonna help put jewelry sellers ahead of the masses is if you really start building your own clientele and then really being passionate about what you sell and knowledgeable about what you sell, it really will help, I guess, help you sell more, but it will also help you build a strong customer base that lasts. So how do you think the passion and the emotion factor into jewelry sellers pricing their items? Well, for me, you know, and I'm only going to speak from my own experience. It helps when I do live sales because people see I'm so fired up about something, <laughs> then they get fired up. So but, yeah, um, in that aspect, it's helpful. On a, on a static marketplace where like you are passionate and maybe overprice it, probably not as helpful. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I don't think that's really going to make, that's not going to make an impact or, or get someone to click buy. Because you see that in clothing, too. Like, the people that really love vintage, they'll price their particular shirt, you know, 0. 0.5, two times market price just because of their emotion and their passion. And as a result, that item potentially may never sell. And I think, like you said, you, you kind of touched on it where um, a lot of jewelry sellers do like the craft, do like jewelry, are passionate about it. And I wonder how much that plays into pricing especially because of the nuance and you know we we talk about selling similar and for a lot of this stuff it's very hard to find similar so we just have to go off of the closest we can find our experience and then i guess that last part of it is like our own personal feelings or opinion of the item that we're holding and then come to a price for that which 
that last part, if there's a difference between you and the customer, that's not going to result in a sale because if the customer has a different, different opinion based on their emotional attachment to the item or how pleasing it is to them, then maybe they'll skip the item or send you a lower offer than what you would want to accept. Yeah, and it depends on what it is too, because there's also people who buy jewelry as an investment. And there's right. also people who buy jewelry as heirlooms, right? Now, right. Not, at, not at the low $10 stuff that you know some people sell, but there are people who specifically will buy pieces because they want they want that particular piece and they see it as an investment. We're talking like museum sure, <laughs> quality sure, type pieces, sure, right? Sure. Yeah. And so there's pieces where people will keep them in their family for generations and generations. Sure. And and that's a whole different kind of buyer. That's different, yeah, yeah. But, and but a different seller too, because that's more of the buy and hold strategy. Yeah. Like yeah. we're, we're buying this and we're holding this for many, many years in order to realize the gain or the profit on our investment. Whereas mm -hmm. most jewelry sellers that I've come across, you know, they, they're trying to find an item and, you know, try to get this thing sold within 90 days, but no model is incorrect. I mean, all models work. We just have to figure out how to make them work. Yeah. And the other thing, too, which I just learned about this last year is um, a lot of uh, jewelry sell like for rare vintage pieces. They're being they're being bought um, by people overseas because they want to replicate them and they want to yeah. remake them. And so sometimes it's a rare piece. And and the person who's getting it is, is someone who wants to make counterfeit copies of it. You know what? They do the same thing with vintage shirts. If you have a really rare one, it goes overseas and they start making copies of it mm -hmm. and they start pr printing reprints of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do the same exact thing. But like for you guys, and we look at, at the comps a lot of times and the stuff um, that does come from overseas, like the jewelry sellers are getting crushed, absolutely crushed by some of that stuff because um, it looks almost identical. And we're talking sometimes one one hundredth of the price, one tenth of the price, one twentieth of the price. And they're just pumping them out over there, sending them over here. And for for some customers, they don't care about that. They, they care about something that looks nice for as cheap as possible. Um, but absolutely, that that has to have, you know, a very, very rough impact on the jewelry sellers. Yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> Yeah. It's frustrating That's because, um, I mean, I understand, I understand what they're doing, but it's still frustrating, you know, yeah. and I don't think there's anything any of us can do to stop it or to change it. Nope. The same thing happens for shirts though. Like if you have a rare shirt and they start making reprints of it, or the brand starts doing what's called retro, like they start retroing the old designs. So like Polo did that around 2020. They went back to their 1992 stadium collection and they started re-releasing it. It wasn't the same because it was of inferior material. You could tell it wasn't the same craftsmanship, but the designs were very, very similar, very inspired by, very retro. And that original 1992 stuff plummeted. And they did that with a bunch of lines. But yeah. They have shareholders to please, so they're they're doing the same thing we are. They're chasing the almighty dollar. So, yeah, that's always the motivation. Always. All right. Um, let me get back to my list here. I think we've covered a lot of it. I did Let's the same see. thing with Hanley. Hanley had a bunch of questions, and just by talking, I answered all the questions. <laughs> and Hanley was kind of stuck. Okay. Um, what was the hardest part about um, leading the jewelry calls? What was the most difficult or the most challenging for you? Well, aside from you hooligans. Um, <laughs> well, I was always a star student, I know. <laughs> of course. Um, I don't know. I think that just being outside of my comfort zone was kind of the hardest part. But um, I guess like hosting the jewelry call was not hard. The 15 minutes prior to hosting the, the jewelry call was more difficult where 
I am someone who, and I take pride in this. I am someone who for four years has been on video for thousands of hours and no one has ever come after and said what he said was incorrect. And I didn't want to do that as part of the jewelry call, mislead people just due to my inexperience or just being naive in the category. So I think as long as I stuck to the facts, um, I'll tell you this, I could not wait until questions started because then you guys could kind of, I can kind of pass the baton to you guys. <laughs> Once we got past like the initial like book report part, um, I was confident in that, but then there, there is like a little bit, a small percentage in your brain where like, you know, I, I don't want to mislead people, but I, I did double check, triple check, you know, made sure that everything that I was saying was like cross-referenced. But I would say like the 10 minutes before, that was probably the most uncomfortable portion because um, I was kind of like a fish out of water, just trying the best that I could. But like, I, I didn't want to like mislead or misinform anybody. So, but once I got into the flow, you guys were very, very helpful and you guys made it very comforting and um, you guys were all on board. And, you know, there, there, there was a couple of times where like, um, you know, maybe there was like a small thing where um, I guess I had a misopinion about it just based on me being a fish out of water. And like Lynn would jump in and say, oh, you know, it, it's more so this. So that was very, very helpful. And that was great. So I guess like, just having you guys out there kind of having my back and all of us just kind of moving, you know, towards, you know, one central goal of just trying to get this figured out. Um, I knew we were on the same team because I was also trying to get it figured out. So, so I think a lot of that, you know, is credit to you guys. Um, I will say like by the third, fourth or fifth jewelry call is way more comfortable, but like the first and second one, um, leading up to it, you know, I, I was a little bit nervous. Like you, you guys are sharks when we turn on that, that camera for the jewelry call. So I, I had to go in there with my A game. Well, you did good. I mean, I learned a lot and I know I'm not the only one and everyone was very excited. And, um, I we used to good. always talk about how much we enjoyed your calls and how you were so like on point with everything. So. Thank you. you, did, you did I, I a great do job. think it's better if a jewelry seller runs it because I think that they understand that nuance a little bit better. And of course, they're going to understand the customer better. I think that factually speaking, sure, I, I, I could do that. But like, I think to really do the, do the call justice, I think a true kind of bona fide jewelry seller is the best, the best course of action. Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. So one of the biggest questions we all had um, when you were teaching the jewelry calls was the proper title structure for jewelry, oh, yeah. right? Because there isn't really, <laughs> there really isn't one um, like, like in clothing, right? And I know we've gone back and forth with this in probably several calls yeah. <laughs> with several different opinions on it. Yeah. So um thoughts your take sure so again i'll preface it by saying i am in no way shape or form a jewelry seller or a proclaimed expert in jewelry um if i was selling jewelry i would go i would lead with brand if there is no brand either genre like um check jewelry or check something um or the best attribute i would lead with that and then I, so I would have brand genre attribute, what it is, ring, necklace, earring, gender, and then the keywords after that. That's how I would do it. Yeah. Remember too, everybody was, was not arguing, but we had a lot of different opinions about, should we put vintage first or yeah. should we put vintage at the end? <laughs> yeah. Should we put gold tone first? Because is it a gold tone? Monet necklace, or would you put yeah. Monet gold tone? Is it it's vintage Monet? Like you know what I mean? There's so many different ways you can plug this in, and yeah. so all of us <laughs> have our own way of doing it. Yes. But who's to say it's right? Who's to say it's wrong? So, like my stance on vintage, either leading or being a keyword, 
Um, the best example that I could make is if you are searching for a Nike shirt, you type in Nike shirt. If you are searching for a vintage Nike shirt, you type in vintage Nike shirt. So I think if, if the customer is going to search for vintage art deco, if that's what your customer is going to search, that's how you should structure the title so you can match ABC versus the customer's ABC. If, if someone is just going to look for art deco, then you should type in art deco and then put vintage at the end. So I think that is one of the nuanced things that, that we were talking about where if a customer goes to eBay, they're going and are looking for a vintage Nike shirt, they're going to search vintage Nike shirt. They're not going to put Nike shirt, use left hand navigation, try to find the item specific vintage, yes or no. They're just going to type in vintage Nike shirt. And I think it's the same way for all the other categories. If your customer is going to search in the search bar, vintage blank, vintage blank, blank, if your customer is going to search that, you should probably lead with vintage. Rather than if, is your customer going to put Nike shirt or Art Deco or an Egyptian Revival necklace? If they're going to put Egypt, Egyptian Revival necklace in the search bar ABC, then our title for, for best match, best result should match that ABC. If, if it is still vintage, but your customer is not going to type that first, those are the instances where vintage would become a keyword. Okay. Okay. And then you're saying at the end, is that right? <laughs> As a keyword? Yeah. So like this is a Florida Marlins hat. If you're looking for a Florida Marlins hat of present day, the mm -hmm. customer will put Florida Marlins hat. If you're looking for the old teal one from 1996, that customer is going to put vintage Florida Marlin hat. And if this was a teal one, I would put vintage Florida Marlins hat in my title because I know that customer is looking for an older item. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, all right. The other thing that a lot of us struggled with in the jewelry call was the 8 into 30 model. Oh. Right. That doesn't that doesn't work in jewelry. No. So no. let's talk about that. So the eight into 30 is just a guideline. It's it's just a it's not a requirement. It's not even a recommendation. So um, clothing sellers, they, they get caught up into that, too, where um, we have the example of twenty dollar profit. And when you ask someone who is reselling or new to reselling and you say, hey, what are your goals? Every single time, I want to make $100,000 profit. And you say, okay. And they say, how can I do this? And we say the least resistance way to $100,000 profit is selling 14 items a day at a $20 profit. That will get you $280 a day, $102,500 a year. That is the least resistance way. If you could list 14 items with a $20 profit, that's easier than 15 at a $19 profit. That's easier than 16 at an $18 profit. That's easier than 28 at a $10 profit. That, that is just a, a guideline just there for reference. Now, the further this way you go into 28 items at $10 profit, that's more resistance than 14 items at $20 profit because why? That's double the listing, double the photo, double the sourcing, double the amount of product. That's, that's double the potentially um, storage. So there are complexities to that. Now, the alternative to that is find one yacht, sell one yacht, and make $100,000. So that's one listing per year, and you make $100,000. So, so that's on the opposite end of the spectrum. So the $20 profit is just an example where if you want the least resistance path, you scour your stores, you find 14 items that you can sell for a $20 profit. So the eight and the 30 is, is, is the same thing. It's just kind of an example. And then however far this way you wanna go, however far this way you wanna go, it's fine. Now the person who, who wants to have the eight into 30 is going to have more time sourcing, more time on the route, because those items are hard to find, versus the person that, that wants to have and a $5 profit, those items are way more plentiful, but much more time prepping, much more time photo listing, storage, or everything that we've already, more time shipping, more time customer service just as a result. 
but that business model works too. Now, however, low margin, low volume does not work. If we're going to do low, low, low margin, we have to do more volume. So it's just an example. It is not a requirement. It's not even a recommendation. It's just kind of like that, that median in the middle of the street and how far to one direction or the other do you want to go? Do you want to spend more time looking for stuff or do you want to spend more time prepping and listing stuff? All right. So it's basically just a gauge, a guideline to say, hey, yeah. this is one way. This is one formula. The least it, resistance way. OK. Because it, that doesn't really work with with jewelry, no, <laughs> as, as so many of us have no, <laughs> have tried to, to figure out. Of course not. But also listing jewelry is voluntary. And if you want least resistance, you get out of doing that voluntary and maybe find something that offers least resistance. Find one yacht and sell it for 100000 Spend all year on the telephone and call thousands of people until you identify a yacht. Now, that is more harder because we have to spend every waking hour on the telephone identifying one yacht. Where the inverse is all the way down to we just buy whatever we buy and run it at 99 cent auctions and hope to make 50 cents per item. But our business is we sell 10,000 items a day at a 50 cent margin. No problem. If you're happy, I'm happy. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Let me tell you this. If, if you had an item that sold $10,000 a day that you made $1 profit on, you would be able to live a beautiful life. You would make $10,000 a day profit. Okay. At $1 profit. But you tell someone it's $1 profit, they say, no, thank you. $1 profit right. one time today doesn't work. But $1 right. profit 10,000 times today, that works great. But I mean, a lot of us don't have the manpower to do right. 10,000. <laughs> but with $10,000, we said profit. So that was even accounting for manpower. But even so, hire a couple people and maybe you make $7,000 profit a day. Boo-hoo, Desiree. I'm sorry. You're only making $7,000 profit today. I think I think you, you will be... Everyone would wish they were Desiree if, if she had an item that sold 10,000 times a day and made 7,000. That's my dream right there. Yes. I would wish I would wish I was Desiree. I know, right? And, but, <laughs> but those are the extremes, you know, and we just have to find our place to fit in, find our happy spot, and build the business around the life that, that we want to live. Yeah, you know, and I think that's part of the tricky part, too, because reselling in general, it's a lifestyle, right? So it's not only about, um, you know, buying stuff, listing stuff, selling stuff, shipping stuff. It's it's all about taking into account how you're going to get this done, yeah. um, what, what numbers make sense, and yeah. what your life looks like doing this. Because a lot of people don't want to source seven days a week. A lot of people don't want to spend hours and hours a day listing, shipping, right. and all that stuff. Right. So let's talk about that. Like the lifestyle as a reseller, do you think, or how does someone figure out what that's supposed to look like for them, whether they sell jewelry, clothing, knickknacks, I don't know, whatever. I think that, I guess first you have to assess how much time you have to dedicate to doing this. And then once you figure out how much time you have to dedicate, I guess coming up with a realistic outcome at the end of the year. So if you only have you know, one hour a day to source, photo, ship, pack, and list, and then say like, I wanna make $100,000 this year, that's very difficult to do. It's probably gonna take more than one hour a day. However, I have had people ask me that before, and I, I don't know how to do that. Now, could, could you buy gold bars? Maybe that's the, that's the solution. But I think first we have to be realistic with our time, with our capacity, with our responsibilities, you know, with, with our obligations. And then we can develop an actionable plan that can get us to a realistic goal. And I think we have to be realistic on both ends of that. Realistic with our time, obligation, duties, responsibilities, and also realistic with our goals. Yeah. 
I think that's hard for a lot of people, especially because people come into to reselling because they need money. You know, sometimes it's right. a desperate situation. Sometimes, um, I mean, I've heard so many stories where people like they're just saying, I need to make money. And I know you've said many times, like, this is not get rich quick. This is not um, <laughs> what do you say? It's not going to move you into a mansion or something like no, that. It's not, <laughs> not, not one particular item is going to move us into the mansion unless we find like the declaration of independence. And some people have found that <laughs> at thrift stores. So like, it's not out of the realm of possibilities, but I think that, you know, setting the expectation and, and like you said, the, the desperation, the desperation is real. I, I started from being desperate um what i discovered though by being desperate is that i had more time than i did money and because i had more time than i did money and i was desperate i put a lot of time into reselling and what i was doing where there were probably times where if you sat down and took a time on it i was probably making two dollars an hour just due to the amount of time i was putting in the expertise that I did not have. So things were taking me 10 times too long than they were supposed to. But however, when you have more time than money, time is your investment into your business, not money. Now, if we all had, you know, VC capital, you know, investment in, into our business, then we have more money than time and we could just blow a bunch of money, but we don't have that. So I think for people that are starting out, I am not against putting in the time necessary in order to start to realize some success. I think every single business, you listen to every single interview of every single great business, and they always talk about the time that they put in, especially during the beginning. And eBay is a business. And if it's a hobby, the IRS still looks at it as a business. So treat it as such if the IRS is going to look at it as such. And I think really getting it off the ground, those first few years are going to take time and they're going to take sacrifice. Um, a lot of people don't know, but I had a son when I was 18 years old. My son is coming up on 21. I was a single dad. Um, I did eBay around my son's schedule. I never missed a baseball practice, never missed a school obligation. I picked him up and dropped him off every single day. But when I had more time than money, the sacrifice was always me. I had to sacrifice a couple hours of sleep because I was working. I was working on my business. I was working to take care of my son, all of his needs. And as he grew older, you know, he, he, he was able to, you know, take care of himself a little bit more where I can give a little bit more to the business. But when he was very young, as you guys know, it's hands on. I've been there. I've been there. I was a single dad. I had no help. Never. I'd been there. But the sacrifice was always me. And if I had to go to sleep two hours later, three hours later, four hours later to pay my bills, I had to turn these items back into cash because unfortunately, the person who collects rent doesn't accept T-shirts. I have to take these t-shirts and turn them into cash to pay rent. And we're going to sacrifice somehow, some way. And for me, this is just for me, the sacrifice was always me. Because I'm not going to sacrifice my son. I'm not going to sacrifice the business because the business enables me to take care of my son, puts a roof over my head. The business comes first and foremost. Because without that, we don't have the life that we have. I, I can't buy him food. I, I can't give him clothes. I can't drive him to school. So the business is always first and foremost. And unfortunately, the sacrifice always came back to me. And whether it was missing meals, going to sleep late, we've all been there and done that. But I think that is the sacrifice where if we were taking an oath of starting a business, I think that that would be part of the oath is that you are voluntarily signing up to take some sort of sacrifice for the betterment and longevity of your business. I agree. And I think too that, you know, people think, oh, I'm going to start selling on eBay so I don't have a boss and I can, you know, make my own schedule. 
But I have to tell you, you end up working way more <laughs> than a nine to five. You end up working way more than than 40 hours a week. And, I, and it I just kind of infiltrates all aspects of your life. I appreciate that you said that you agree because it's very taboo, especially in this. You know what I mean? Because like you said, we do think that we're going to do this and we think it's the four hour work week. And it's not. It's not. And I heard something the other day that said, and it kind of stopped me right in my tracks. And a couple times a year, this happens. And they said, your dream job is still a job. And that kind of made me stop. Very profound. A couple times a year that happens where I hear something and it hits me. So like, while a lot of us are doing our dream job, this is still a job. And you know, I've had conversations with other single parents because I was a single single parent too. And um, a lot of a lot of us don't necessarily want to do eBay. It's not that we want to be yeah. eBayers, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's at least for me, it was a means to an end or it is a means to an end. I'm not trying to be an eBay superstar. I, I mean, it's not if I could throw it all away tomorrow because I had some other fantastic, fabulous, amazing thing to do. I absolutely would. But I think a lot of us um, use eBay in, in the sense that it fits into whatever you need it to, you know, however yes. you need it to fit in your life, it will fit. Yes. If you need to do it part time, if you need to do it triple time, if which yes. a lot of us did, because yes. I was working, I would say two full time jobs when <laughs> at Absolutely. one point. Absolutely. And um, so that's the thing about eBay. It's not that we love eBay, but we love what eBay can do absolutely. for us. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. In, in our lives. And, and, and there were times in my life where my son's school district was an hour away. And I was driving my son an hour to school, driving an hour back, and then leaving three hours later and driving an hour and driving an hour back. I was spending four hours on, on the road every single day. And that's 20 hours a week. So most people were living like seven day lives. By the time you factor in getting ready, sitting in traffic, coming home, I was living six days on a seven day week. And eBay was perfect for that. Because what mm -hmm. other job can you have when you're spending four hours a day on the road? there's no job. And eBay worked around that. So when he was at school, I would source when he came home, ate fourth meal, I busted out some photos. When we went to the baseball field, we went to baseball practice, we went to a game, got him taken care of. I did my listings when he went down and went to sleep. And that was my life for many years. And I'm very, very thankful for eBay and reselling for that opportunity that allowed me to make money, not only make money, but build a business that I can call my own to you know find some self respect in that of like I'm growing this to find some pride cuz those were very very hard times in my life very very hard and a lot of single parents can relate that was very hard cuz you're dealing with a lot of extracurricular stuff you're trying your best i had some pride i had something i can turn off the world and focus on and do my work put in my headphones I could see this thing building because of the work that was that I was putting in. So not only was I able to earn an income with driving four hours a day and doing backflips and, and going to baseball practice every single night, I, I, I was able to grow something and make something flourish and watch it grow before my eyes. And I think that it, in that portion of my life, that was super important for me. And that's interesting that you say that because that's how it was for me too. Like for me, it was different with my son though. It's that he was sick all the time. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't, I couldn't work a regular job because oh. I was taking him to the hospital or um, he was, he was in the ER. Like we would be in the ER almost every month because he oh. was so sick. So it was the same thing. My son was sick a lot. So I needed something that where I can make money while I'm sitting in the hospital, while sure. I'm in the waiting room. Right. And um, so it's, I totally understand that. But, you know, like we said earlier, you really can make eBay into whatever you need it to be. Whatever. Yeah. Yep. But uh, hobby, part time, supplemental, you know, try to get out of your full time job, go full time, 
become eBay superstar. Like you said, every single level of those work with eBay. And how many times can you call out of your job because you're at the ER once a month? Eventually, that don't fly no more. And, and that's why eBay is perfect for situations like that, for situations like mine, because life is not perfect. Like we're, we're always going to have like imperfect situations. And like I said, I, I am forever thankful for the opportunity that eBay is and, and the opportunity that we have today to, you know, take pictures, know about the item listed on online, make a profit and do it again tomorrow if we so please. Yeah, it's definitely a blessing. I think so. Okay. Let me look at my list and make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, all right. So you pretty much gave us a bunch of tips about how to start reselling and reselling jewelry. Let's talk about future projections. What do you think? How do you think eBay is going to look or just reselling, I guess, in general? What do you what do you see? Like, what do you think the industry or the reselling game is going to look like a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? I think that although it is getting more competitive every single day, um, just due to what we've talked about, the desperation, um, especially with the economy, um, you know, finding a job is very difficult. Um, I think the desperation, I think that, um, you know, the amount of resources that are line kind of, you know, help people do this for the first time, which I think is fantastic. So I think it is going to get way more competitive. However, you know, since we are so lucky to be in the most wasteful country in the entire world, that us as Americans will continue to donate, disregard, get rid of stuff. So I, I don't think there'll ever be an inventory shortage. So it will get more competitive. I don't think the inventory is going anywhere. And with the future projections of online sales and with pre-owned items, um, you know, being sought after and not being shunned, I think that because I've seen projections where it comes to pre-owned clothing where like, you know, we're, we're at $20 billion right now in, in pre-owned clothing sales. It goes up to $200 billion. There, there, there's no amount of resellers that is going to be able to surpass where the projections are going. So I think that, sure, it is going to get more competitive. I don't think that there's shortage of inventory in the United States of America. And I don't think that there will ever be enough resellers to supersede the market for pre-owned goods with how it is trending now. Now, when I was a kid going to Goodwill, you would get clowned for that. Now, every kid after school goes to Goodwill. So I think as that generation grows older, they are already accustomed. They are already used to pre-owned, sustainable, you know, good for the environment. That is only going to continue to trend up. So I don't think that us as resellers, us as eBay sellers will ever be able to supersede what the market will tolerate. So for those reasons, I don't think that we have anything to worry about. Sure, it will be, get more competitive, but we just have to get better. What works today might not work tomorrow. Like you said, make relationships, contact the state sales. There will be a state sales forever. We just have to find enough of them where we can get them into our, our, our ecosystem where our phone's ringing every single day because we have that many people looking to supply us with product. I don't think the product is the issue. I, I don't think the market is the issue. And, and I think being creative, not resting on our laurels, like what works today isn't always going to work. We're gonna have to refine. We're going to have to learn how to pivot and we have to learn how to get better if we really want to do this. But Reselling has been around for thousands and thousands of years. They, they were doing it in markets, you know, back before we had the printing press or, or anything. Like people have been reselling forever. It's not going to go away with the invention of the computer. It's just going to get more widespread and more accessible. And, and more people will accept the fact that, you know, buying secondhand is sustainable, is better. 
you know, for, for all the reasons that they talk about. So for me, I'm not worried one bit. Yeah. I don't know if I'm worried, but when I, when I think about what's happening now, I think what's going to change as it relates to reselling is the systems are going to change the way we list, especially with the integration of AI now. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think the way, the way we resell is going to change. I already see shifts happening as it relates to that. So like yeah. you said, I don't think there's a shortage of stuff to resell and there's not a shortage of, of people willing to find it and, and resell it. But I Absolutely. do think that there will be more, um, there's going to be, I guess, maybe less hands-on and more automation as it relates to reselling. Now, this isn't going to work in every category, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But like um, with clothing, weren't we talking about that? I think on one of the calls, there's like a machine that can photograph we were hundreds talking of like, shirts or something. Like, Yeah, like <laughs> theoretically, once that machine gets built and it can do 100 shirts an hour, 24 hours a day, yeah, that'll be a game changer. But, you know, once upon a time, people were taking pictures on 35 millimeter film, dropping it off at CVS and bringing those 3.5 um, photos home. And they were scanning them on their scanner and listing them onto eBay with one photo on the listing. So yeah, absolutely. The game is always going to change. We just got to, you know, be, be on the forefront of the change. And that's why I love Desiree news of the week because Desiree is always on the forefront. Desiree has her own That's little right. AI going. I was looking at, <laughs> at one of your videos and I didn't know if it was AI or the real Desiree the other day. So <laughs> you're always on the forefront. And I think that is super important. That's exciting to me. You know, I always think, you know, because I, I do miss doing news a lot. I truly do. Like, I really miss being in the newsroom. I miss being out in the field. However, um, I just don't want a corporate job anymore. I don't want to be in that structure of of someone telling me where yeah. I got to be, when I got to do, and or what I got to do, like and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if I could, if I could have my own like network or something, <laughs> you know, my own my own thing going on, I totally would. I totally would. Absolutely. Well, you got your own thing going on here, so we're still waiting for um, reseller news of the week. Like, if you could. If you can get all the reseller news and you can give all the links, I'm tuning into that. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Mel said the same thing. She's like, Desiree, you really need to do this. You need to do this like with a, with resellers and social media and all that stuff. And I said, I would love to. I would love to. I totally there, there's would. There's even if... people like when stuff is really popping off, they have their own news networks on YouTube. Like sometimes they I do. tune into those. And they're more accurate and they get the news faster than what mm -hmm. you see on the regular TV. Like when it's really popping, I turn on YouTube news. I do the same thing. Actually, Twitter will um, come yeah. out with stuff like almost instantaneously. Instant. Instant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so I would like I said, I would love to do that uh, because that that really is my like my passion as well as you know my skill set too i just love to do that i love to i mean we talked about this you know i love to dig i love to yeah. research i just love to do that yeah and uh, i don't know if that will ever go away I, I i really don't because my son was asking me the other day he's like how long are you going to do this like reselling stuff and i said until i don't have to <laughs> right until something better comes along sure, so absolutely so, you know, who knows? Hopefully this podcast will lead me lead me in that direction and create some opportunities for that to, I to think become you're doing my a fine reality. Job. I think you're doing a fine job. This has been an excellent A1 podcast, if you want my opinion. You've come with the heat today. Good Aww. question. Um, I like it. Thank you. All right. So before we wrap up, uh, let's talk about your Patreon group. So how can people learn more how can they connect with you um you know whatever <laughs> thank you <laughs> however Desiree. so first and foremost i did not come on here to plug anything or promote anything i came on here because desiree asked me and desiree asked me and i said thank yes you. i would love to be on there so with that said i'm not here to promote plug anything um my name as it appears on the screen if you wish you can find me on instagram mm -hmm. you can find me anywhere else but I am not here to plug or promote anything. I am here strictly because my friend from the YouTube call asked me to be here and I am honored 
to be on the jewelry chat as a clothing representative. So I do appreciate it, but not why I'm here. I'm here because you asked me to. And and I do appreciate you and your success is important to me. So that's why I'm here. Well, thank you very much. And with that, um, I will have a link to Tech's Patreon group in the show notes, <laughs> even though he said that's 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 not why he's here. I'm well, not. You asked me and I said, yes, <laughs> absolutely, I would. Yes, I know. But the thing is, is this episode was so juicy. People are going to say, oh, my gosh, how can I learn more? Oh, my gosh. I want to I want to like, you know, take my reselling game to the next level. I'm telling you, they will. They will say that. I appreciate that. And and I appreciate that. And I understand. But you will never see me doing the podcast circuit, plugging my stuff. That's not why I do it. And a lot of people have asked me to do podcasts. And I've only done two. I've done it for you. And I've done it for Johnny B on the media call. Why? Because you guys are on my team. And those other guys are not. And if you're on my team, you know me, you know my personality. If you're on my team, I will do anything within my power to make sure we all go to the top. So you said you were starting a podcast. You said you were doing the podcast. If there's any kind of way, any way, shape, or form that I could help, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to help this podcast, and I'm here to lend a hand to Desiree because she asked me to be on the podcast. And like I said, Desiree's success is important to me, whether it's reselling or being on YouTube. And you asked me, and I'm honored to be here, and I'm glad to be here, and I had a lot of fun, and I do appreciate you asking me to be on. All right. I accept that, and um, I appreciate that. Oh, yes. And I'm so grateful that- Likewise, thank you. That you took time out of your day, because I know how busy and in demand you are. So- yep. but. I think being busy is a fallacy. If you remember, you know, your teenage years, when you had a crush on a boy or girl, there was nothing in this world that would stop you from doing something that you wanted to do. And I think if you really want to do something, you will make time to do it, no matter how busy you are. So I really wanted to do this. No matter what we got to do, we'll get it done. And I'm yes. very happy that we got it done. Yes, even though it took us several weeks because you got sick. <laughs> I did get sick. That I get a pass from that one. As soon as I got well, we was ready to rock and roll. So That's I think right. I think if people want to do something, they will do it regardless of how busy they are. I totally agree. I totally agree. All right. So um, I think that's going to wrap this up. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your thoughtfulness so and fun. you sharing you sharing the knowledge. And uh, yeah, I guess that'll be it. <laughs> That's great. This was fun because like it's questions that we normally don't get to talk about. So I enjoyed it. And just like how you said, what was the most difficult part of the jewelry call? And I was like, not the jewelry call. It was the 10 minutes prior. It was the same for this one too. The, the most difficult part of this was not doing this. It was 10 minutes before doing this. So <laughs> I'm happy we got through it and I didn't look like a fool. Um, overall, thank you very much for, for having me on here, Desiree. I appreciate you. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for everybody <laughs> listening. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you.